Good afternoon. We're here today at the Des Brisee Museum participating in the Reach Out to Seniors um, oral history program. And um, my guest today is Bob McLaren, and I'm Marion Gaytan. And Bob is going to tell us about his experiences with the radio station CKBW here in Bridgewater. So Bob, I guess my first question to you is, uh, you were obviously just a young man when you started here, why radio? It was almost by accident uh, when I started in radio. I had a girlfriend in Bridgewater back in 1952, and I wanted a summer job, merely a summer job, as I was going on to other things uh, later on down the road. So I came to Bridgewater looking for something, went to the unemployment insurance office at that time on King Street, and the man in charge at that time was Charlie Latter. Uh, some of the senior people might recall that name. He was a quadriplegic from World War I. Anyway, he said, first of all, are you interested in a job in radio? And I said, no, I don't know anything about radio. I said, why? Well, they're looking for a part-time announcer at CKBW. So I said, no, I'm not interested in that right now. Something else just for the summer. I wound up working that summer for Finney's, which was located on King Street in Bridgewater. They sold pianos, other musical instruments, furniture, flooring, and of course uh, records at that time. They had a record bar, which would have been 78 records. We're talking about 1952. And I was a 17-year-old at that time. So I started working at Finney's, and after about two weeks, I kept thinking about this radio station job. So I went down for an interview, saw the station manager, Jamie McLeod, gave me an audition. At that point in time, I didn't have any idea what an audition might be. Anyway, I did the audition, and he said, fine, when can you start training? And I said, well, I work six days a week at the store and doing deliveries, etc., but I can come in at six o'clock in the evening when my workday is finished. So that's how it started. I trained on the control board first to operate all the controls and playing records and so on. And then the announcer who was on duty said, okay, your turn in the booth, you read the commercials. Uh oh, this was the big breakthrough. So after I did that, then they combined the both. You do your own operating and your own announcing. And that's how it all started as a part-time announcer, 1952. Okay, now where was the station located at that time? It was in the Solar Building on South King Street in Bridgewater. Um, currently there's a pizza shop there because the building in later years burned. And it was in the upstairs area over at that time the Canadian Tire Store, but Canadian Tire built a new store across the street, directly across the street, and that was the nicest new building in the town of Bridgewater at that time, a two-level Canadian Tire Store. But then, after they moved, um, another store moved into that location, which was the uh, South End Grocery, and eventually the South End Grocery morphed into the Shamrock Supermarket under Bert O'Neill, and when the corner store of the White Star Pharmacy at the corner of King and Dufferin burned, they moved into the vacated store that was the South End Grocery underneath the old radio station. But then in 1967, the centennial year, we acquired space in the Bridgewater Shopping Plaza and that particular area was built specifically for the radio station with soundproof rooms, etc. Now, when you joined the uh, station in 1952, I know it had first started on the air on December 24, 1947, I believe. That's right. Yes. And um, what, 
Was there anyone from the original management team of, of the radio station there at the time you started? Oh yes, uh, definitely. In fact, uh, the radio station was the brainchild of Lester Rogers. Mm -hmm. Lester was a schoolboy growing up in Truro, okay. and he had a fascination with radio. Now I'm talking about the late 20s, early 30s. Mm -hmm. He used to build crystal radio sets. Mm -hmm. And he moved to Bridgewater and opened Rogers' electrical store, which was very close by underneath what eventually became the radio station CKBW, roughly the same location, next door to the Canadian Tire Store and so on. After he got operating there for a while, he met another chap who worked at Canadian Tire, his name was Don Hill, and they talked over the possibility of starting a radio station here on the South Shore, located in Bridgewater. But they needed some broadcast expertise. So they recruited John Hurdle, who was working at CHNS at the time. He was the son of the principal of Bridgewater High School at the time, uh, A.G.G. Hurdle. And he came back to his hometown and worked with them. That was in 1946. They acquired an old Plymouth car. He went on the road selling shares in this proposed radio station. And during the year 1946, they accumulated enough in share holdings that they could go forward and apply for a license through the old BBG, that's prior to the CRTC, for a broadcast license in Montreal. They acquired it and that's how the radio station was started and they were able to acquire the equipment, uh, the towers, transmitter, etc. from RCA Victor and uh, it was established and put on the air as you mentioned December 24th 1947 in a blizzard. In a blizzard, that's a <laughs> good way to start. What would be the distance of the transmission at that time? The distance at that particular time, mind you, it was only a 1,000 watt AM radio station, but the electrical interference at that time was not as it is today. And an AM transmitter at 1,000 watts put out a, a quite a strong signal. At nighttime, our signal would go into the east coast of Newfoundland, and uh, the reason for a pattern change that we had to make at sundown every night was the fact that WCFL in Chicago was on the same frequency and they were 50,000 watt clear channel stations which meant clear channel no one could interfere on that frequency so we had to change broadcast pattern somewhere between Bridgewater and Chicago our signals would clash and just create hash on the air uh, that would vary depending on the atmospheric skip, so we ha always had to change pattern at sundown. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it was 1,000 watts at the outset, which in later years was up to 10,000 watts. Mm -hmm. so, so, like if I said, to what town or anything would that get you around here? How long? Well, our, our primary focus was mm -hmm. the area from Chester to Liverpool. Mm -hmm. Shelburne uh, just on the fringe, mm -hmm. but primarily Liverpool, Bridgewater, Lunenburg, Mahone Bay, those were the uh, main towns to cover, but our signal certainly was getting into the Chester area very strongly as well. Okay, so when you started there, um, you said that you started as a um, excuse me, part-time announcer. What type of programs would, would the radio be transmitting? All the while I was at the radio station from 1952 straight through until I retired in uh, January of 1995. We had what is termed block programming. We did portions of our day in country music, portions in uh, adult pop music, and night times we would do the current chart topper hits. And that was the block programming style, something for everyone. Uh, in later years, of course, uh, that changed into something else. Um, I had I had read somewhere about you you presented like during this time some some of the recorded series like the old ones like Armis Brooks and that's and, right. Um, we we used to run transcribed shows. Uh, we were 
we were actually a, a CBC Trans Canada radio network station affiliated with the CBC for programming. We were not compensated by the CBC for carrying their program, but it was a requirement of our license that we be an extension of the national broadcasting system. And we had to take so many hours per week of CBC programming. And we tried to take most of it in the evening hours, mm -hmm. which was less detrimental to our commercial base, which would be morning daytime hours to sell local commercials. So that many of the evening hours were taken up with CBC programming coming from Toronto, Vancouver, or wherever. And, uh, of course, the national news uh, at night. Uh, our evening programming was also made up, as I mentioned, of transcribed programming uh, in the early evening in particular. And we had things like, oh, Boston Blackie, Deadly Nightshades, etc. Uh, some of them were quarter-hour shows that were continuous five nights a week. And other ones were just plain uh, one-shot performances uh, week in and week out. Uh, that they were not a continuing series. Um, so was there a lot of uh, s commercials that were, were sponsored? Mm -hmm. Oh, we had a tremendous amount of uh, commercials from uh, local businesses on the South Shore. That is what kept the radio station going. It's the only source of income is your commercial base. And uh, we had a, a full sales staff on the road initially Lester Rogers uh, was the sales manager, and for many years he handled all of the advertising sales all over the South Shore. In later years, uh, he recruited another salesman to work with him, and in my time, we had four salespeople on the road on a continuous basis. It was really, really important to uh, cover all bases for uh, retail sales. Someone had mentioned something about um, contests, that uh, sponsored contests with big prizes or something. That the That's radio right. Would have. Uh, there were uh, a number of different uh, contests that were run over the years. Um, I remember of uh, doing some, uh, like on a Saturday morning, things that would uh, appeal to kids. Uh, some were entry forms from box tops or that type of thing. Um, there were various contests, sometimes only a little short contest, a five-minute thing on the air. Sometimes uh, it was a quarter-hour type contest on the air. Some was phone participation, some was mail-in. Uh, draws on the air. I remember Robin Hood Flower, for example. Uh, that was a continuing thing that we carried for quite a number of years. What, what do you define like as live programming? What would that be? Live programming would be, for example, uh, remote programming. Um, if we were out in the field uh, covering something like, well, in the old days, uh, like the Queen of the Sea contest mm -hmm. in Lunenburg, that would be a live program with remote broadcasts, and we would do the whole thing on the air live. Um, it could be play-by-play uh, -play hockey, it could be play-by-play -play baseball, which I did a lot of uh, in those early years. We had the uh, Halifax and District Baseball League. Uh, Jerry Regan, who later mm -hmm. became Premier of Nova Scotia, mm -hmm. he was going to university at uh, Dal at the time and then to law school. He would come down from Halifax and we'd go to the Liverpool Ballpark or I would meet him in Kenfield or at the Wanderers Grounds in Halifax and feed the live programming back to the radio station. Sometimes we joined into a network with other radio stations, especially if there were playoffs, and he would do the play-by-play. -play. CKEN in Kenville would pick it up, or CKCL in Truro would pick up the feed. Sometimes all of the stations in the Atlantic region would pick up that feed. We did the same thing with uh, playoff hockey. Um, the senior hockey was going great guns in Bridgewater back in that era, and he again was the play-by-play -play announcement. Uh, I would 
do the commercials and between period interviews and he would do play by play. So sports coverage was an area that really interested you? It was. Uh, I was always very much interested in sports and uh, in fact after I was working uh, oh, probably in the first uh, year or so at the station I volunteered to take over sports and did all of the sports casts. I became basically the sports director at the station. Later on I became a news director and still carrying on my full announcing duties. This was all an extra thing thrown in. And eventually I became program director at the station. That was in 1961. Uh, eventually that became operations manager at the station and it, it morphed into uh, me taking over as general manager of the station uh, when we, we sold to the Irving Group in 1989. Um, one other type of program that, that was mentioned is like the, the call-in telephone things. Yes, uh, the, one of the uh, most successful uh, call-in programs uh, that was ever aired on CKBW was one that I hosted along with uh, Ginny Fleming. It was called Telephone. And that's, again, a program that just sort of came out of the blue. Uh, we decided we'd do this call-in thing, uh, uh, actually an exchange of information, uh, buy, sell, trade, that kind of thing. And then somebody would call in and say, I wonder if I could get a recipe for, you know, muffins or donuts or cookies or a cake or something like that. And I couldn't take shorthand, and I was on the air alone. And this just exploded like in one morning. So I called one of the secretarial staff, who happened to be Jenny Fleming, to bring a notebook and come down to the studio and give me a hand. And she was absolutely petrified of the microphone and wouldn't say anything, but she took down everything in shorthand, etc. Well, she took all these notes back to her desk, typed them up, put them in a binder. After a while, I did get her to respond on the air, and uh, eventually she became part and parcel of the program. But all of this information just stacked up in binders. And one day we got talking about it and said, well, what can we do with all this? We decided we'd do a cookbook. The cookbook were all local recipes, including household hints, how to remove ballpoint ink from something or uh, a stain of grease from something else, etc. And that's how the first telephone cookbook uh, was put together. We decided we'd order a thousand, not knowing whether we'd ever get rid of them or not. We sold them for 50 cents a piece with the, the money going to the Canadian Red Cross. Well, they just flew. So we did another thousand, and another thousand, and another thousand. I don't know how many we actually got out of the station. Well, time went on, and more of this material built up. We did the program for 13 years. So eventually we decided, well, let's do another one, but a better book. So we put better covers, better binding on it, and so on. Same thing. I think we charged a dollar for them that time. Same deal. We donated the money to the Canadian Red Cross. Out of that grew a bake fest. So we decided we'd hold a bake fest at the Legion Hall in Bridgewater. People could bring their prized recipe in and eventually at the end of the night they'd be auctioned off. We did a live broadcast of the auction by the way. One girl from Brooklyn, Queens County came down from Brooklyn on the train mm -hmm. with a big chocolate cake about this high on her lap and took it to the Legion Hall to compete for the prizes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had uh, uh, people judging, you know, the quality mm -hmm. of the baking, be the cookies, cakes, you know, yeah. whatever type of thing. But anyway, uh, the money was uh, garnered from the auction. Again, it went to the local charity, the Canadian Red Cross. But that was Telephone, a very, very successful program for 13 years, which ran from 10.05 in the morning right after the news until 11 o'clock, every day, five days a week. 
Now, I know that a number of things have happened over the years, okay? And uh, one thing that I, I was looking at there a bit was in um, May of 1955, uh, there was a forest fire that occurred in the Hebville Bridgewater area. Yes. And I understand the transmitter for the radio station was in the Hebville area at, right. at that time, hey? Um, so I understand certain things happened in relation to that. Well, yes, uh, that was uh, quite a situation, uh, really. It was a tremendous forest fire. In fact, the town of Bridgewater was in danger from it. Uh, it was wind-driven, and it started uh, well to uh, the west of Hebville and swept through the area of the transmitter site. Transmission lines were burned, and of course the studio was no longer connected to the transmitter. So we had to go to the transmitter site and make temporary arrangements where we could broadcast directly from the transmitter itself, the transmitter building. A uh, board was set up by our engineer and so on, so we had a temporary arrangement with a couple of turntables and so on. But it was mainly to keep the information going to people as to what was happening uh, in the fight against this fire, to try to control it. Uh, it was really a, a touch-and-go situation, and uh, the station received the Beaver Award, which is one of the... Uh, top awards in the country for broadcasters for the coverage of that particular fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the transmitter uh, and the towers did not burn okay. in that, that, in that, that particular one. situation. Mm -hmm. no. And then I understand um, the next year, 1956, there was flooding in the area. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, CKBW would be the only means of getting some information around. Well, <laughs> that's right. Uh, it, it was a case of a uh, uh, huge amount of flooding, uh, roads cut off and all that kind of thing. But your local radio station becomes the integral part. A uh, newspaper obviously can't do it. Um, the only uh, source of information is uh, by way of radio. And uh, that's how local radio prides itself in, in supporting the community. Um, how, how was your information or your means of recording and using things on the radio? How was that stored and what type of, you know, was it, like you mentioned binders earlier, but I mean there must be old type records or something that... Well, back originally, uh, prior to the tape recorder, mm -hmm. Uh, things that were recorded had to be cut on acetate discs, and they were either 12 or 16 inch discs. In fact, uh, we used to do uh, remotes back in the very early days, in that period from 47 up until, I guess, about uh, 51, somewhere along there, where if you wanted to do a program, which they used to do at the radio station called In Town Tonight, it was what we call a remote broadcast from a, a central location. They may be just down on the sidewalk in front of the radio station, but they would take the disc recorder down there and record the program, say at 6 o'clock in the evening, interviewing people and maybe running a sidewalk contest or something like that, and as soon as the disc was cut, it could be taken up to the studios and played on a turntable as a remote broadcast or they could do a uh, remote from Lunenburg or New Germany. It just meant that the program had to be recorded, cut on the disc directly as it was being done, and someone had to bring that disc back to the studios to be played as a live broadcast on the air. That's how that was done. Mm -hmm. But then in that area of 51-52, and I well remember our first uh, tape recorder was an Ampex portable, and uh, when I talk portable, the thing was probably 80 pounds in weight, mm -hmm. and one person was expected to take that portable along with all the cables and microphones, and the microphones are not like today's microphones, they were heavy, to go out to do a remote pickup someplace. And that was really a breakthrough to get a, a tape recorder in studio. And uh, then eventually, of course, other uh, 
Ampex tape recorders were added, and that became the thing in that era, reel-to-reel uh, -reel, uh, tapes. tapes. Uh, you could tape and delay programs, so you could do interviews, you could uh, record uh, an hour-long program in one of the uh, studios and play it back a day later, two days later. In fact, at Christmas time, we would spend days during the evening hours recording Christmas programming so staff could get off over the Christmas holidays. And one person could program the radio station by playing back-to-back -back tapes. So as, as time went on, uh, of course the radio station would uh, increase its power and its ability to transmit. Um, yes, that's right. Um, the 1,000 watt power output uh, eventually became eroded, as I alluded to earlier, because of more and more electrical interference. And in order to get the coverage we needed, good solid coverage for the South Shore area, we decided to up the power to 10,000 watts. And of course you have to go back through the CRTC at this point in time to get approval of it. And that was approved. We went ahead, um, upgraded uh, all of the equipment and so on. Of course now we're located uh, in our new studios uh, in the Bridgewater Shopping Plaza at that particular time. And that was the AM power increase but there was much more to come. Mm -hmm. In order to uh, increase the coverage on the South Shore to provide a signal farther west, we had to do something about a transmitter further to the west of Hebville in order to cover Liverpool and then ultimately Shelburne. So an application was made for an FM transmitter so we could feed our signal from the AM transmitter in Hebville to a tower in Liverpool that would supply a good solid FM signal to all that Liverpool area. And the next step was to put a tower down in the Shelburne area to get our signal, a good strong signal, in the Shelburne area. We did that in steps and then after that was all installed, we were able to up the power at both locations under the CRTC regulation. You could only have so much power on a repeater station. So they changed the rules and we were able to increase the power to give us good solid coverage all over the South Shore, all the way from uh, Chester straight down to Shelburne County, which opened up a whole field as far as news coverage was concerned, uh, the commercial returns, etc. So it was a great move for us at that particular time, but an expensive one at that. Now, in it was 1967 that you moved to the new building there at yes, the uh, Bridgewater right. Plaza. Eh? That's right. Okay. Now, you must have had a lot of... Uh, did you have a lot of equipment or files or things like that? that we we had... Tremendous amount of uh, equipment, um, some of which uh, was replaced by new, updated equipment. Um, the latest equipment we were able to use at our new location, but we had to uh, buy a tremendous amount of new equipment because technology changes dramatically over the years. Uh, one of the backbreaking tasks of moving, and I remember it so well helping to move the thousands of 78 RPM records mm -hmm. that were stored in our library down on King Street in Bridgewater. There were thousands of them and we used a half-ton truck lugging them down, stacking them on the truck, taking them to uh, the Hebville transmitter site. It was a, a basement area. Uh, we had the racks taken out of our studios on King Street moved back there, then they all had to be put back in in index files mm -hmm. at the transmitter site. Well, that was fine until 1974 yes. when we experienced a major fire. Mm -hmm. So we lost all of that and all of our work was down the tubes. Yeah. 
So, what happened? <laughs> well, what happened, uh, we had an early season snowstorm in October of 1974, and this was just after four senior members of the staff had bought the radio station mm -hmm. from the retiring John Hurdle, Lester mm -hmm. Rogers, and all the outside shareholders. Mm -hmm. We were just getting our feet wet when we had this major snowstorm taking out all the power lines, etc. Well, we had no power to the transmitter site. We couldn't do any broadcasting, so Jamie McLeod, who was our station manager at that time and one of our partners, got hold of the CBC and they had a variable frequency transmitter that put out about 500 watts. They were quite agreeable to loan it to us. We got a trailer, put the transmitter in this trailer. Our engineer got it all hooked up, but still no power to it. Nova Scotia Power was unable to supply people to run a power line to that transmitter trailer. So another partner in our company at that time, Bob Lowe, who had some electrical experience, said, I can run the lines if we have the material to do so. Nova Scotia Power said, we'll give you some poles and we'll give you the wire. You can hook it up to the grid, but if you can get it in place, we might be able to get someone there to hook the wires up. Well, that's what we did in waist-deep snow, Jamie McLeod, Bob Lowe, and uh, the other partner, our engineer, Doug Hurdle, put up the poles, the wires, got it hooked up to the transmitter, and then called Nova Scotia Power, and finally they got somebody to hook it to the grid. Now, what happened, why we lost the transmitter in Hebville, there was an electrical arc when the power came back on originally, and it caused the fire and it burned our transmitter building. So we lost two transmitters, not only the main transmitter, which was the 10,000 watt transmitter, but also our standby 1,000 watt transmitter burned the building and it had to be completely rebuilt. And of course we had to apply to RCA to have new transmitters built to that frequency, et cetera, et cetera. And that took some time. Otherwise, we'd have been off the air for months. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is what got us through that Christmas period, which was so critical from a financial point of view, because Christmas for radio, TV, uh, and, you know, your local stores, it, it's really critical to the, the whole year. So we were able to get through Christmas without losing any monetary value at all, except a lot of back-breaking work. And then eventually in the new year, we got our new transmitters and got things back to rights again. Well, that's basically what happened. It was a, a rough start for us in a partnership to, uh, to lose our main transmitter in, in that fire in 1974, October. But I take it from there then that things continued to progress? And they certainly did, yes. Uh, we went on uh, from there. Uh, after that 74 period, it was uh, in 80 when we went on to the FM transmitters that I had alluded to earlier and continued to expand. We as, uh, as partners, now two years after uh, we had bought the station, uh, we lost our chief engineer, Douglas Hurdle, and uh, the three mm -hmm. shareholders continued to operate the station. Uh, that would be Jamie McLeod, uh, Bob Lowe, and myself. Mm -hmm. And in 1989 was the next big step where they were at retirement age, and we decided we would sell to New Brunswick Broadcasting which was owned by the Irving Oil Company. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed on at that point in time to manage the station. I was uh, vice president and general manager of Acadia Broadcasting until I retired. Um, I understand the 
um, last time the transmitter there in Hebville was replaced, was that about 1994 or so? But I'm not quite sure of the uh, of the date. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't recall that at the uh, at the present time. Mm -hmm. Um, I retired uh, at the end of January in 1995. Um, I would question the uh, the 94 time uh, for change of transmitter. Mm -hmm. I, I can't really can't recall mention. that. Okay. So, as I say, you left, okay, in um, January of 1995. Certainly after 43 years there, you've had a um, lot of role changes um, over the years. I always joke about it and said, everything from janitor to general manager. <laughs> it was a very interesting uh, career nonetheless. Uh, you meet so many uh, great people, uh, an opportunity to uh, interview people from all stripes from uh, the sporting world. Uh, I certainly recall opening what was then the IGA store. Mm -hmm. uh, today you call it no frills, mm -hmm. but in between it was save easy. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, George Hibbelman uh, was the uh, first manager of the IGA in Bridgewater and Jack Dempsey was the special guest and I interviewed him in the window while the people waiting to get into the store uh, stood outside and watched us through the plate glass windows. Uh, that was just, you know, one of, of many, many incidents. Uh, I had the uh, pleasure of uh, uh, spending time with Danny Galvin mm -hmm. and uh, uh, people of that nature, various premiers of the province of Nova Scotia, and um, certainly I remember so well uh, the fun days of working with uh, with Jerry Regan when he was still a university student, mm -hmm. to think that he would go on and become premier mm -hmm. of the province. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I understand in um, 1996 um, you became a inductee into the Canadian Association of Broadcasters Hall of Fame. Yes, that's right. Uh, I was a nominee from the Atlantic Association. The previous year I was made an honorary member of the Atlantic Association of Broadcasters. I had served as president of the AAB and uh, I don't know, for some reason they decided uh, I should be their nominee and uh, I was inducted in Edmonton at uh, the CAB uh, annual convention. Okay. And uh, that was certainly quite the honor because when you consider the names who are in the CAB Hall of Fame, it's, it's quite overwhelming, really. But uh, for somebody to come out of a small town radio station, I guess uh, one of the major marks um, was at the CAB level when I worked with the CAB and uh, the local member of parliament to get the reduction in fees for small town uh, radio stations. It was based on um, some kind of a, a weird formula of gross product and it was just killing small radio stations mm -hmm. and this particular fellow uh, understood the plight and took it to the Treasury Board and was able to get a substantial change in the licensing fee arrangement under the CRTC and I think that certainly um, <laughs> made a lot of headway along the way uh, as far as my induction into the CAB was concerned. Yeah. So for someone who started out not really thinking that you'd be interested in radio, <laughs> then, <laughs> then obviously <laughs> it, you went a long way um, in it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm very pleased uh, with my career. I, I certainly would do it all over again if I could do it in the same way. Mm -hmm. However, radio has changed so dramatically over the years. Uh, nowadays, you don't spin records anymore. Everything is on hard drive, and uh, you just don't have the same kind of personal contact as in my era in radio. And I'm not downgrading uh, the way it's done today. It's just an evolution, that's all. Mm -hmm. And uh, times have to change, and so they are. Um, when we had broadcast conventions in the past, 
like for the Atlantic Association of Broadcasters Convention, we'd have 200 people attending with various personnel from each of the radio stations because they were all independently owned. Mm -hmm. Now with the mergers and so on, you could hold a convention on a phone booth. And basically the same thing applies nationally because there are vast chains of radio stations now. They may have 15, 20, 25 stations under one chain where those stations at one time were all individually owned. So when all the personnel came together, you had for a national convention 1,000, 1,100 people attending. They were quite the conventions, but I'm sure things have changed dramatically in, in those areas. So I really had um, the best years in broadcasting that I could possibly have asked for. And they were a lot of fun. Uh, every day was interesting. Every time you went to work, you had no idea what that day was going to bring. You could never plan because there was always something that would change, be it a fire, an accident, somebody to interview, whatever. There was always a change. Well, it sounds in that you've had a very satisfying uh, career, and we certainly appreciate you taking the time to come and speak to us today about it. Oh, and I have to say, maybe I'll look at the radio station just a little bit differently now. <laughs> so we appreciate it very much. Thank you. You're quite welcome. <laughs>